Imagine a vibrant discussion between people that includes both openness and critical thought in the pursuit of truth. The Purchasing Truth Podcast is an experience, a journey, an exploration of the impact that negative messages in politics and the media have on our families, community, society, and nation. Join your hosts, Bill Sterling and Tom Hazard, to discover new concepts and language strategies that will reveal effective ways of establishing truth. This podcast series will tackle current events, leadership challenges, healthcare confusion, integrity in business, and many other areas that affect us all. Gain clarity and understanding of the various truth perspectives. Welcome to Purchasing Truth. Welcome back to Purchasing Truth. I'm Tom Hazard, along with your host, Bill Sturley. And, you know, Bill, I think I've had more facepalm moments in the last week than ever. And it's like we have this national, actually worldwide tragedy going on now yes. with the coronavirus, COVID-19. And we have... That, that As if that tragedy wasn't bad enough, we've got an administration in the White House that, you know, that with the marketer in chief who's trying to market his way to being a wartime president and the best leader possible now. Unfortunately, the tragic language coming out of the White House and behaviors would really question his do question his leadership every day and then the yes. press corps the journalists are really guilty of yeah. a tragic process and tragic use of language which isn't going to reveal truth at all and it's it's just uh, i i yeah it's, it's, so it's a facepalm moment it is facepalm moment so the your, your frustration because We've been hanging out together and talking about how to get truth to come forward and how to engage truth in a more effective way. And um, the the way journalists have been taught to pursue truth, you know, if we if we were to look it up, there's five forms of that, you know, and whether it's investigative or news articles or reviews or columns or features the investigative style of journalism is not getting us there. The, 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 the reviewing or asking questions in order to seek facts and accurate information hasn't helped us much because the, the, um, they change it into the pursuit of facts to the promotion of opinions. So, and, a journalist will pursue a fact and he changes it into that they're trying to reinforce an opinion. That's what he does. He gets them to reinforce an opinion. <clears throat> Meanwhile, it's like, this is not a, an opinion. We have this piece of information. We're asking your take about it. He says, well, you're just fake news because you're just asking an opinion and you're trying to reinforce an opinion from the liberal media. Notice all of a sudden I am taking the journalists and I'm not, I am not playing their game. I am having them play my game, which is a branding, marketing, sales game. Here's this really neat thing, shiny lure. Um, I'm going to throw this lure in the water with a string attached and pull it just like I'm fishing. And then as soon as you bite the hook, you have just been sold. So that's the thing, you know, it's shiny lure, throw it in the water and jiggle it as you're pulling the fishing rod and reeling it in for all those fishermen know exactly what I mean. <laughs> it's a jiggling lure moving through the water. And then as soon as the person bites it, they're hooked. So the journalist doesn't even know that they are on the hook. They think that I'm a smart fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I'm sorry to laugh, but that is really funny. You're right. There, if, uh, the hook's not going to get me. The hook's not going to get me. And the answer is, is that why are you swimming after the fit? Why are you swimming after the hook to begin with? So they, they miss the space between the stimulus and the response. The stimulus is the lure. The response is them going after and inviting it. Having empathy and compassion for the lure swimming by, it's like, nice lure, I'm not biting it. Even if the fact is not true, that's not what's going to help. You know, this is a really good metaphor, Bill. I, I like it. I, I, for At first, I was like, hmm, where's he going with this fishing thing? But no, I, I get it. So, But the difference is the journalist, instead of asking a question and framing it in such a way to say, Mr. President, that is the most beautiful lure I've ever seen. Wouldn't you agree? And he would say, well, yes. Well, instead they're saying, well, that lure is not really live bait. It's fake. And it's like, right. no, it's not. No, it's not fake. That's the most beautiful fish food you have ever seen. That's, that's right, Tom. You just, you just, you just got it. It's like, you've got to, comment on the lure from an empathetic compassionate way the way they the speaker would like you to take it and then just you know then they reel it in and they have no fish on the hook because you didn't take the bait they don't they don't make the issue about lamestream media that they've been labeled a fake news that they've been labeled. No, you use it as the way you need to use it, which is, hey, Mr. President, you feel confident. You would like Americans to get back to work. Is that correct? Yes. Sounds like you would let them to go, like to get the, them to go back to work sooner, wouldn't you? Oh, yes. You would like the economy to get started because one of the things that you enjoy is you know, the stock market to stay really high. Is that correct? Oh, yes. See, he's reeling the lure back in. He doesn't know that they're not on the hook. He's actually having to own his motive. See, they don't, they don't get him to own his motive. His motive is to appear strong, confident, respectful, rich, self, high self-worth, high identity but meanwhile yeah and then after 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 three that's called the magic three after three of these yeses they start to run out of steam because they're just tired of really throwing the lure out and reeling the lure back and not catching anybody but the journalist is just like a school of hungry fish just take it one if one of them won't take it the other one will take it take the hook and now he's got one of them on the line he waits for it there's a huge reason why those press conferences are having right now it gives them the opportunity to fish for counter narratives to reinforce on the stage during the republican national convention He's just looking for the sentences. Remember when that reporter said, yeah, fake news. You know, it's like, no. It was a naive, underskilled, to label and diagnose, journalists that don't know how to manage somebody that is in this space. They're not interested. He's not interested in truth and government. He's not even interested in truth from his, um, you know, advisors fully. I don't and think so, he's interested in truth in his personal life. All he's interested in is is winning. Whatever it takes to win, <laughs> to him is where his moral compass is if i'm winning i'm good if i'm losing i'm bad and i always need to be winning because that's my brand right i'm a winning brand 
um, I got to thinking about this this morning. Um, his his off ramp is bankruptcy. That's his off ramp. He's taken the off ramp of bankruptcy many times and is assigned the blame or judgment to others that caused his exquisite leadership to fail. And the people have got to really realize that this experience of bankruptcy is when all is lost and you got to like pick up the pieces at the end and everybody's got to mourn the losses and in this case we're mourning deaths we're mourning financial security we're mourning national respect international respect we're mourning um uh cooperation and collaboration because anybody that picks a side is not trying to work in a very adult like way my but they're all they're doing is my way on the highway so the missing link then is how do we engage the process of being compassionate to somebody who has had multiple experiences of bankruptcy and trying to get them trying to walk them back off the cliff before he takes them over takes them us over the cliff because he's taken a bunch of people over the cliff now even to death which is disturbing for me to even just be do scary honesty about it it's you know people have died because of lack of preparation and lack of protection so if journalists were to start leading with words like protection, safety, prevention, and throw him a few softballs that he can hit. So the, the audience realize that he's under skilled at this style of administration. He's, he's, he's under skilled at it about dealing with an invisible threat. He's in, under skilled at dealing with what the constitution says about what his powers are, you know, and, and, and that that's, he's under skilled because well, yeah, you know, he I thinks would, it's one way, but it's not. It's not that way. I'd, so. I'd like to add that I think he's underskilled in his ability to provide the nation what it needs to meet its biggest need right now, which is for safety, security, you know, uncertainty he the, that takes emotional intelligence and empathy right that you know he was we talked about this a, i don't know four or five episodes ago i think and i don't want to go down too deep but it's a really good example here is the president was served up a really slow pitch softball and um you know within the last month by peter alexander of nbc news and said mr president what do you say about two americans that are worried now there was a lot that came before that and the president had it in his mind that he that peter alexander was not being respectful to him him being the president and he was annoyed by that and the president did not even realize this was a slow pitch softball that he could have knocked out of the park as a home run. But if he had only said, well, I understand Americans are concerned and that's understandable. And here's what I have to say to them. I mean, he could have turned this into such the father figure president moment, moment with ease and won the moment. That would have been the story. Trump, the father in chief or the leader, all this stuff, it would have been so easy for him to do and not 
he would have not had to back off of any of his other positions or, or beliefs or, you know, policies, if he could yeah. have just been a comforting father for a minute right. and he was incapable of it. So that's why I say he doesn't have, you know, they talk about IQ and EQ, you right. know, he doesn't sure. have the, the emotional, um, well, to, there's to a scale. There's a there's a scale in which I have uh, one of my slide decks. So I'll have to put it up sometime. A scale of how do you know if you are good at emotional intelligence? How can how can we measure somebody being empathetic? Okay, so so I developed this scale so that at least it can give people some perspective of what it takes to both do empathy for yourself when you're upset. You know, or empathy for another when they're upset or empathy with an entire group when they're upset because that's the top skill is can you do it with a group of people it's one thing to do it with yourself it's one thing to do it with another person now just like a driver's license everybody thinks they're a good driver well as soon as you mention the word empathy everybody says yeah i'm i'm, I'm pretty good at that like like probably 80% of the people say, oh yeah, good. I have the empathy thing down <laughs> until you say, well, listen, I just want to let you know that, you know, one of my clients has uh, COVID. What would you say to them? They're, they're deer in the headlights, deer in the headlights. And they come up with a sympathetic statement. I'm so sorry to hear that. That is a sympathetic, that is not an empathetic statement. <laughs> they can't even empathize with themselves because if I say I have a client that has COVID, here's what could show up in their body. Was Bill exposed? I, I'm scared. That's what could show up in their body. They don't even know how quickly that took place. They can't even catch it be there. So their emotional intelligence school score is, you know, below a four. Really, I hear that your client has COVID. I feel a little worried and scared and I need some safety and protection. Were you exposed? <laughs> they can't even realize that they've been activated. Really? And they take two steps back, you know, whatever. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> really? When were they exposed? You know, they're trying to, they're trying to do what the journalists are trying to do, trying to figure out if they're in danger or figure out as journalists do is like, well, that's not really the truth, Mr. President. They're trying to like swirling and said, just be compassionate and empathetic to the president and what his motive is. So Peter Alexander's motive would have been something like this. Mr. President, I'm guessing that you're really feeling enthusiastic and you're trying to convey that enthusiastic to the Americans that we're gonna be all right and we're gonna get through this. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Now what he's doing is being compassionate and empathetic for the president being a pitch man. You can't say, oh, Mr. President, you're being a pitch man and trying to paint a rosy colored glasses on this. But the president has never, <laughs> has never had the opportunity to spend time in loss ever. He doesn't spend any time in loss because he goes, ah, oh, what did that cost me? Well, I didn't lose too much. But boy, look at the brand recognition I got out of it. Boy, look at look at all the people that, you know, really, I had a great time at that party over there. It's like... Or look at my ratings. He's always... Uh, look at know, my ratings. How many people watched it? That means it's people good. watched it. That means it's good. That means it's marketed well. That means he is a brander. That means he's a seller. That means he... He is trafficking and, and, and uh, you know, uh, fishing lures. So all of a sudden my comic brain just went up and I could just see Trump holding a suit coat open 
with fishing lures hanging on the inside and the reporters asking him questions. See, let's where's draw the, that. Let's draw that comic up. Yeah, where's the New Yorker cartoonist when you need him? <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. I mean, that's that's literally. He just uh, you know opens up, pulls the fishing lure out, and throws it out. You know, and one of the one of the you know the the reporters reporters are going to bite into it. You know, that would be an interesting teaching moment in journalism school, too, that, that this, this metaphor of the president is fishing amongst all of you journalists sitting there in the press corps in the White House briefing room. And really, the majority of them are taking the bait and, and in all ways, taking, going after the lure, whether it's the Fox News journalists who are going to give the president what he wants and bite right. the hook directly or it's the journalists who are trying to get at the truth who are not going to bite the lure but are going to flatter him about the lure to then reveal the truth despite you know have uh, allow the president now allow is probably the wrong word to entice the president to reveal the truth right without even realizing that he's doing it right yeah they it's in and many times in, in in empathy is not a manipulation strategy empathy is a strategy of connecting to where the person is getting the person in the agreement that yeah this is thing is important and meaningful to me and then you know uh, you know gently having them see that there's an other side and they they would benefit from at least seeing the other side, not doing the other side, just at least seeing the other side. So if my kid is asking me for ice cream at, at 4.45 and I got dinner coming up in 15 or 20 minutes, um, he wants ice cream. Well, I don't want to talk him out of ice cream. He likes ice cream. Why do I want that fight? I'll empathize with ice cream. He's still not getting ice cream, but I'm still going to empathize with ice cream. Why? Because I'm focusing on health. He's focusing on taste. Do I want to talk him out of his taste? Do I want to tell him his taste is bad? Do I tell him this, this taste is more important to that taste? It's like, oh my gosh, I want to empathize with where he is. I don't want to talk him out of it. And that's what reporters do is that they get stuck in trying to go like, you can't have ice cream. That's not true. He's going like, this is great ice cream. I want ice cream. You know? So. <laughs> anyway, well, so that's, that's what the missing link is, is that to get, to get an empathetic moment, um, actually three empathetic moments, as he is trying to um, uh, put the lure in front of them um, and, 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 and do your best. I, I, I know you want to prove and, and get him to double down on stuff. And it does make him look worse. But what happens is people are dying as you're doing that. So you may want to, you know, want to get him to a place to, hey, yeah, um, I'm in charge of this thing. And, you know, here's the, you know, another event during my president where, uh, during my presidency, where another upheaval has happened. This is um, probably, if I were to count on the small scale, the fourth upheaval in this experience over the four years. But there's more like, I don't know, I have to keep, I have to think about how many upheavals the nation's been through, you know, from the, you know, uh, <laughs> gosh, should we make a list? The Mueller report, you know, and, you know, yeah, the impeachment the and impeachment you know, the, the, and the, 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 the perfect phone call. I mean, perfect it's phone all call. Sorts of it's all kinds of upheavals. So, so um, we want to be empathetic and compassionate to the president. It doesn't mean we want to be in agreement necessarily with his version. the The people that are already voting for him are already on the hook. So they're already in the boat. They're already in the bucket. They're uh, they have no, they they really literally do not have. Uh, have the idea regrettably wow now that i'm saying it i'm getting sad that they are in the bucket and they're soon to be di they're soon to you know die you know they're not they're not going to make it out of the bucket and 
and and uh, you know there's there's been many 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 people. I think we're up uh, over twenty two thousand right now that have passed over this because the the function of the the federal government is proactive. Was used to be proactive protection. Keep the disease on other people's countries. Keep it over there. Don't let somebody's disease land on your shores. Don't let it do it. And if it does, quarantine the crap out of it. There was one Ebola person that showed, uh, one Ebola things, and like, I don't know what it was, seven that were around that person or 10 or 15 around that person. They had a tent, they had a quarantine, they had fences, they had that person in New York City there, and all the Fox News people and, and Trump could say is, he let it get to our shores. Trump, Obama let this get to our shores. It's like, he let, there was one person, and, and they literally threw, you know, I would say millions of dollars to keep it to be only one person. Sure. You know, but that's the, that's the truth that it's really hard to get a hold of because it's a perspective like looking at the whole world rather than a perspective like looking at it, the world as a flat disc, you know, which is, we're just, we're just moving from one flat disc to the next. Well, so Bill, uh, so journalists are taught, you know, really to go after facts. There's either yeah. the, the news approach, which is the direct, the who, where, why, what, when, and what, and, and how right. of things. And that's really what we see these journalists in the press corps doing daily is trying to get the president to state facts agree with facts or they're trying to put facts in front of him and get him to admit something he's probably never going to admit willingly and that's not very productive you've got this five styles that journalists are taught investigative journalism news articles reviews columns and features and each have a different sort of purpose and focus but no it appears nobody is teaching journalists and 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 we need to come up with a name for this, but nobody's teaching journalists to empathize with who they're talking to, to get at the real truth. And one great example you and I were talking about over the weekend um, came from 60 minutes and it's, it's different. And I think it's maybe a good example because there was no, um, it, it, it was not involving the president directly. And so it's good to sort of show a different example. And um, it was with probably what is thought of as one of the news organizations that has the most integrity, which is CBS and 60 Minutes, which is decidedly an investigative news program. These people do their homework, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And so uh, I forget the journalist's name, but he was interviewing um, Peter Navarro of the current administration. Sure. sure. and, And he... Um, they, they get into this, you know, di- sort of really tense discussion where Peter Navarro is feeling, I think, on the defense and saying, nobody knew that this kind of pandemic was coming. Nobody could have prepared and known. This is, and this we hear coming out of the president from right. the podium a lot. You know, nobody right. knew. We're doing the best job possible. And, of course, Navarro says, you know, you never asked the Obama administration about anything regarding pandemic response. And you guys haven't done a story on this in the past with past administrations. Why, basically, why are you picking on us, the current administration? And the CBS uh, anchor, the, the interviewer said, oh, I guarantee you we have, meaning CBS. I guarantee you we asked the question during the Obama administration. Yeah. And it's, that it's a, was a tragic moment. Let's talk about correct. that for a minute, Bill. You know what? I really appreciate you bringing up this example because um, the need for respect, the need for truth, recognition, acknowledgement gets in the way of finding truth. It's 
the reporter saying, I am confident that we did. He's stating his truth in a respectful way. Now, regrettably, that's a part of the polarization we're experiencing right now between Democrats and Republicans. They aren't respecting each other or going for what their point of view is. They're allowed to, because of money, they're allowed to participate in more in silos because they're not accountable to the people, they're accountable to the donors. So now let's get it back to what this reporter could have done. Okay. And I, as you were asking me the question to coin a new type of journalism, I think I might have it, but I, I, we don't have to settle on it today. Okay. Okay. So I'm the journalist. Peter Navarro says, show me a story that you have done at st 60, 60 Minutes in the Obama administration. And they did two of them, one for the H1N1 and one for the, the Ebola one, you know, right? Did two of them, that it was in-depth reporting of the scope, how the federal government was handling it, the mistakes, the learning lessons, where people stubbed their toes, what the nation had and didn't have, ways the nation improved and made changes in order for it not to happen and the mitigation and most certainly you know we you know we dodge this bullet for xyz reason okay all right so the exasperation that just showed up on my voice is is that what the journalists needed to do is say this sentence so mr navarro you would like and you have confidence that 60 minutes you and the president have confidence that 60 minutes has never done a story like this and you would like us to have the same scrutiny over the obama administration as that we do under your administration is that correct now what he did was he he he's now has to say yes i would like you to have the same level of of scrutiny so you would like us to add, to have asked them the same hard questions that we're asking you regarding here comes protection preparedness protection and safety you would have liked to ask them the same questions is that correct yeah there was never a story about so it sounds like during the research and, and, and preparation for this pandemic that um, you and the president and his team might have went back and looked at other pandemics that might have been coming our way and kind of like did some things about it and prepared for it. Um, um, yes. <laughs> now all of a sudden, Navarro's not out there, but the entire team is out there. Okay. So this is a way to collaborate with the 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 journalist is collaborating with where the person is in their belief structure in their mindset in their marketing messages trump good obama bad that was that's the market that's been a consistent marketing branding message trump good obama bad Trump can fire people on a reality TV show. Obama has eight years as a president. What has he done? This guy, decision maker, is going to be better than that decision maker. Everybody knows the authoritarian father never makes a mistake. You know, you can see, you know, I have a few tools here. So how did that feel as soon as I use this collaborative style of journalism going let's collaborate with the person i'm speaking with rather than trying to fight prove disprove do what one upmanship okay so how does that sound to you does it, that sound a little bit better it sounds much better it 
it becomes less combative, less contentious. Correct. And right. you're, you're, you know, when you go down that combative, contentious path, the person you're asking questions of is going to shut down. They're going to get indignant. It is not going to yield the results you want, unless the results you want are just to, you know, make somebody have a tantrum because right. that's good for ratings. I mean, if that's your goal, then, you know, then I don't know. To me, you're no better than uh, who was it, Morton Downey Jr. show or what were some of these other ones that did that a lot where they just try to get everybody angry at each other in a, in a big um Sort of yeah, catastrophic yeah, climax, yeah, yeah, you know, right? uh, you know, the Jerry Springer show, yes, you know, that's Jerry one. Springer style of uh, reality TV. Wilkos is there. There's a couple other folks that just just stir the spot, uh, stir the, uh, you know, they stir the pot, let people fight and film it, you know. Yeah, and and really, that's what happened. So the we're recording this just after you know easter the the tuesday after easter and then monday after easter was one of the most combative contentious white house coronavirus you know press briefings that has existed yet and and it's amazing that we can keep raising that peak level higher and higher and higher as we go through history here in this administration but Trump was really fighting back because he's received a lot of criticism and he was receiving it in that press briefing. And he's like this cat that's backed into a corner who is going to claw his way out any way possible. And unless you do what you're suggesting, what, you know, what the CBS anchor could have done on 60 minutes and what the white house press corps, you know, the journalists could do there, unless you collaborate and bring some empathy and compassion. Like you said, meet that person you're questioning where they are where first. They are. Mm -hmm. You got to meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. Then you'll get actually, you'll, you'll be more productive. You'll get some right. of the answers you want. It will be revealed, but they're not taught this. No, no. It's really the sixth thing on the list. A collaborative journalism style is something, I mean, my, my creative brain started going all over the place here. It's like, hey, maybe I could do an online course that all these universities can sell, you know, because they can't, they can't deal with these kinds of people. They can't. And, and the, the scrutiny um, um, that, uh, that politicians are going to be under going forward is like, you know, we're a psychologically wounded nation. Whether we we like it or not, we're in we have some big troubles showing up for us. Big. Because um this is not a localized New Orleans Katrina event. This is a nationwide trauma and a worldwide trauma. There's a nation, the, the world trauma is here's how these other countries have to recover after the psychological threat of here is a disease that can take you out and you don't want to take it and don't want to get it and you got to isolate. See, let me say it this way and it'll get really unsettling. Our naivete about um, protection and safety has um, uh, been pulled back. Mm. This is something the military can't fight. In fact, it got into one of the big ships, right? It's like, yeah. Yeah. you can't, you can't fight this. It's not an easy enemy. And it doesn't, it also doesn't hurt that it also went after the system that has a lot of brokenness to it, which is our healthcare system. So now all of a sudden that stuff has got to be rethought because, you know, whether it's Italy that does have socialized medicine and still didn't take the preventative and protective 
things. And of course, didn't have enough ventilators and didn't have enough preparation coming in. And, and it ran through there well, like wildfire, you know, with Italy and, and some of the inclusive countries inside Italy, um, uh, as well as, um, uh, you know, inside the United States. So this is Katrina. And, and I, I was on a restorative project in a, a school district right outside of New Orleans. And it was like a year, a year and a half after Katrina. And the kids that were, the kids that were in school were traumatized. They couldn't learn hardly anything. They didn't know when the next hurricane was coming. Their, their perspective was this really bad thing happened. People we knew died. And because we're a eight-year-old, we don't know when the next one's coming. They have no, an eight-year-old doesn't have perspective that these kinds of, these kinds of events don't happen. So the nation, all, all there needs to do is here's this other virus coming from this other country in three years, five years, and, and we'll go nuts, you know, with the next one. Remember the last time we ain't doing that, you know? And so we are going to be facing some very, very unsettling experiences coming up because of the level of that, trauma taking place because of it. I mean, I, I was on the phone with a client and, um, and he had gotten COVID and recovered 17 days in isolation. Luckily didn't have to go to the hospital, you know, kind of dodged that bullet, but lost his company, had to shutter it, Ugh. had to let everybody go, you know, had to, you know, uh, put a house on the market, you know, um, couldn't do it, couldn't do anything about it because there's no money to pay for stuff. Had to reshelter himself in a different location with his family. So they're also with him. So very, very burdensome. And to come back around to collaborative journalism is, and one that applies empathy is, is that, you know, Mr. President, you want everybody to know that you're in charge. Is that why you're saying that you have the uh, ultimate decision, that your decisions last? And he's talking like an authoritarian. He's going like, this nation is a collaborative process. It is not an authoritarian process. And and the the more, you know, Joe Biden gets onto that narrative, the better off he'll do. You know, the more, uh, you know, you've got to get people to participate in democracy, not isolate, you know, you know, in separation. Can't, can't do that. So, so it's, it's, there's, there's all these different convoluted metaphors because, I mean, he came into office as an isolationist. And he's going to leave his office with all of us in isolation. That's really interesting. <laughs> I mean, just to take the the orbital well, view of this. And, well, I mean, and what he's doing, and then you know, you could take this analogy even further that he is separating people, dividing people, isolating them more. You're either right. on my team or you're not on my team. You're for right. me or you're against me. And, you know, you journalists, you are the enemy of the state. You, you journalists, you know, are, are no good because you're, you're always against me. I mean, he is not someone that brings people together. And that's where this, these journalists to me are again, just so tragic. I mean, that 60 minutes interview of that journalist had not, he, he got to the point where he retreated to arguing facts with Peter Navarro. Yeah. Oh, I the, guarantee you we ran that story. I'm guarantee you we did that story. I'm quite sure we did. You know, don't do that. Don't. That didn't make any sense because it was interesting. Their method was to get Peter Navarro to say, there's no way you did that. 
Nobody it, ever did that. And all they did is afterwards played the clips of the three different 60 Minutes stories from 2005, 2009, maybe in 2012. Or there was, it spanned Bush's administration to Obama's. All the, and all they the just said, basically at the end, I'm right and you're wrong. Exactly. That's, that's all that journalist did. That's all that happened there. I'm right. You're wrong. We're better. You're not. Uh, uh, we're, we're standing for truth. Instead of, you know, let the guy fall on the sword. Don't bring a sword up and say, oh, I'm going to cut your head off. Because what winds up happening is, is that that level of truth is not as important as the discharge of empathy for every every voter that has that is loyal to Trump that needs an off ramp, all of them need off ramps. We got to help them out. The poor the poor Republicans need an off ramp. They need something to get off. They can't. They're they're literally you know crack cocaine addicted to this guy and to this well, experience. And it's maybe really hard actually, to, to be honest about that. And maybe that actually learn something, yeah, and potentially change their behavior going forward when they feel this sense of guilt and shame that, wow, yeah, my statement, you know, even if they don't say it, they would think, wow, my statement was really wrong there. I should have done my homework first. I should have, you know, we, we, maybe we didn't respond fast enough. Now, Trump, I don't think is capable of that himself in terms of admitting guilt and, you know, or apologizing for anything. and See, anybody that does it, anybody that admits guilt or admits weakness, he fires from right. just, just, just Jeff Sessions on. I mean, and any, anybody that shows a weakness, it's like he doesn't even know how to do his own off ramps other than firing somebody. It's, um, for somebody that knows the smartest people and we have the best people <laughs> then to fire all of his own smartest people is, is a unsettling truth. But at the same time, the smart person knows how to collaborate and cooperate with others and get them to do stuff and cover their butt for, with things they don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, we used to, you know, we used to poke fun at George Bush, Bush too. We used to poke fun at him, not, but at least he had people around him. But the people, he doesn't even let the people around him help him. No. And in fact, Fully. he, he, you're right that people that show weakness, he gets rid of people that he questions their loyalty he gets rid of even faster. Anybody who, even if they speak the truth or answer the truth under oath, well, right. you, you didn't support me and my team by towing the line, meaning by lying for me, therefore you're out. Right. 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 And it's, uh, how did we that's, get here, Bill? <laughs> that's it. That, that's it. Well, we got here because well, the great question, by the way, and that's our that's our that's our own off ramp for our next episode is is that you know how we've been sold and how this guy has uh, you know uh, Trump with the with his gifts and 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 language of of marketing and really adjusting and we we've done episodes on the dopamine adjustment he does with language and the enticement. He's always about enticement, anticipation, uncertainty. That's his language style. And all those things that the journalisms don't, journalism folks don't even know is that they take the bait, they take the enticement, they take the anticipation, they take the uncertainty, they take the undeliverable reward and amplify it. That's what they do. It's like, you know, yikes. So again very very unsettling so uh you know the and what we can do is really talk about how did we get here and and then also you know what uh the republicans that want to do to restore their party can do and what the uh, democrats uh can do to 
um, to have strength. See, empathy is the position of strength, always, always. Uh, people think of empathy as you're submitting. It's not a submission. You know, it's like, I'll kick you in the forehead with empathy because you cross my line and I know which line you cross. I'll let you know about it. You know, if you don't meet the need for respect, I am going to let you know about it. And so, and, you know, Biden during the debates, you know, and I'm guessing they'll, they'll stay six feet apart from each other on the debate stage, you know, I'm, I'm just sure. to keep the joke going. So that's the thing. It's, <laughs> that's the thing. It's the strength of empathy to be, a, to create a collaborative experience back again and, you know, and to engage that in a way that's kind of healthy. Yeah, Makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about that next time. And I think we are inherently, another thing I want to tie into that is that the way society is right now and the coronavirus is is playing into this, we're definitely getting into a pendulum swing toward a we cycle, not a me cycle. And the president is all about me, not we. So it's very interesting, and we'll see how this plays out. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, it's good, uh, good, good catch. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Well, yeah. I look forward to that one. Until next time, Bill. Thanks so much. All right, take care. Thank you for listening to this Purchasing Truth podcast. We trust that you have enjoyed this engaging and thought-provoking conversation. Our hope is that you've received value, found clarity, and broadened your truth perspective in this episode. If you did, leave us a review or visit our website, purchasingtruth.com. Join us again for another informative and content-rich discussion here at the Purchasing Truth Podcast. Don't just accept whatever information comes your way. Join the discussion. Discover your own voice. Purchase your own truth.